Exacto. Okay. Okay. No, I'm recording, I think. I'll maybe repeat the introduction. Otherwise. Okay, so today we have a guest in our journal club, and Michael Landry from Colombia, and he will talk about non equilibrium effective field theories and the second sound. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. I have a much repaired. All right. Can everyone see my screen right now? Yes, yeah, I can okay. see. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, this is based on my uh, recent paper published back in August. This is the archive number. Um, so I'll give you a quick review of what second sound is. Um, at finite temperature, if you heat up a condensed matter system, could be superfluid, could be solid, uh, you get a thermal bath of phonons. And this bath of phonons behaves like a fluid that can flow independently of the original uh, substance. So if you have, for example, in uh, solids, first sound would be lattice vibration. Um, second sound would then be the pressure wave that flows through a fluid of lattice phonons. So these sorts of things always exist in superfluids and only sometimes exist in solids. Uh, and the reason is that in solids, lattice momentum has to be conserved in order for you to have second sound. Otherwise, the fluid is forced to move with this with the solid degrees of freedom. And so that that kills second sound. And that's done by unclap scattering. Uh, that unclap scattering is the process by which lattice momentum is is non-conserved. Whereas in superfluids, the second sound arises as the goldstone from the spontaneously broken particle number. And that is exactly conserved, at least in a non-relativistic setting. And so you always have second sound for superfluids. So I'm going to approach this from the perspective of non-equilibrium effective field theories. So ordinary effective field theories uh, these are Lagrangian's action principles. So they uh, describe only conservative systems, meaning systems without dissipation or damping of any sort, uh, something where there is no arrow of time, where they're reversible. Uh, but a lot of finite temperature systems, in fact, all finite temperature systems have some amount of dissipation. Uh, and they also have some amount of statistical fluctuations and potentially quantum fluctuations as well. So the non-equilibrium effective field theory defines uh, an effective action on the schwinger heldisch contour. Um, this is also known as the in-informalism. It's the way that you deal with a, a density matrix uh, as opposed to a pure state as your equilibrium state. And so we can classify all sorts of condensed matter systems based on their uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking pattern. And that helps with the formulation of these kinds of EFTs because you can look at the Goldstone bosons. And so we're going to look at solids from the perspective of non-equilibrium effective field theories and, uh, and look at their Goldstone excitations essentially. So here I'm going to take you through some of the um, basics of non-equilibrium effective field theory. Uh, so there's this weird sort of divorce between conserved quantities and, uh, and exact symmetry. So you can have an exact symmetry of your effective action without a conserved quantity. What I'm going to do here is explain both how to construct an effective action and how to make sure that your quantity is actually conserved. So suppose that we have some sort of U1 charge Q. Um, doesn't really matter what it is. This could be a uh, particle number, for example. Then if you want to create a generating functional for the uh, conserved currents, so just a, if you want to compute endpoint functions of J, for example, which is the if J is the only conserved quantity, then in the deep infrared, uh, these sorts of correlators among the various Js are going to be the only things that really matter in, um, in the deep IR. 
So what you can do is you can couple J to some gauge field A, and you can define a generating functional given by equation one, where this W of A1 and A2, unlike an ordinary generating functional, it has two, uh, two arguments. And the reason is that if you want to evolve a density matrix through time, you need two copies of the uh, time evolution operator. Notice that if we set A1 equal to A2, then cyclicity of the trace allows you to move this U dagger over to uh, this side and it cancels the U, which then gives you just trace of row, which is normalized to one. And so W equals zero whenever A1 equals A2. So you do actually need two different uh, sets of, of fields here, of, uh, of sources. So because these A mu's are coupled to conserved J currents, the generating functional enjoys this, uh, this gauge symmetry, this U1 gauge symmetry. Uh, you can shift A1 and A2 independently by uh, different gauge parameters, lambda one and lambda two. And this allows you with a Stuckelberg trick to uh, write down an effective action that reproduces this generating functional. Essentially, the idea of the effective action is you want something that you can write down as a derivative expansion that when you integrate out the fields reproduces the original uh, generating functional. And so this is done at a rather abstract level because ultimately, it's impossible to calculate what our uh, effective action I sub EFT is just because it usually requires dealing with strong coupling regimes and all sorts of uh, difficulties that make performing an actual computation for all practical purposes impossible. So we're just going to do the usual EFT thing and guess the form and then write down the most general linear combination of symmetry and variant terms. So the Stuckelberg trick is basically to include sources and then include your fields as a gauge transformation of your source. That way, when you integrate over these phi one and phi two, you arrive at a functional that depends only on A and is manifestly invariant under any kind of gauge transformation of this form. So moreover, the, the fact that uh, W is invariant under these kinds of, uh, of gauge symmetries is equivalent to saying that J mu is conserved. That's an if and only if statement. So by defining uh, this effective action in terms of Stuckelberg fields, we ensure that this U1 quantity is conserved. If you want to have a conserved stress energy tensor, then you do a very similar kind of process, but instead of using a U1 gauge field, you instead use metric tensors because metric tensors will, when you differentiate W with respect to a metric, you get uh, the stress energy tensor. Uh, and I'm going to use S equals one, two to indicate which field it is. Um, this is often called a schwinger keldish contour. So uh, if I say schwinger keldish contour, that just means it has two copies of the fields. Uh, and moreover, we have to define it on world volume coordinates, uh, phi m. This phi m space is a rather abstract space and I'll, I'll tell you more about it later, but for now, just know that you have to define it on some phi space. And then the Stuckelberg fields are maps from your phi space into your physical space time given by these x coordinate fields. And then your effective action uh, can depend on the metrics only in the form of these pullbacks by the Stuckelberg fields, uh, such that if you integrate over x1 and x2, you obtain a generating functional w that is uh, the equivalent of gauge invariant for metric tensors, meaning it's diffeomorphism invariant, which means that the stress energy tensor is conserved. <clears throat> 
So here are ba the basic rules. I kind of hinted that on them in the previous slide, but I want to state them explicitly. So you define your uh, effective action on the schwinger keldish contour, which means that you have a doubled field content. Uh, it's often convenient to, instead of work in the one, two picture, to work in the so-called retarded advanced picture. So the retarded fields are the symmetric combinations and the advanced fields are the anti-symmetric combinations of these fields. The reason why they had these names retarded and advanced is because if you include sources uh, and you do sort of linear um, perturbations, uh, the way that, or linear response, I should say, the way that the retarded field responds to a source is uh, via a retarded propagator and the way that the phi A field, the advanced field, uh, responds to a source is via an advanced propagator. As such, phi R behaves essentially as a classical field or the expectation value of a quantum field. And phi A is, um, it basically encapsulates the noise and statistical and even quantum fluctuations uh, around the expectation value or your classical value phi R. So then uh, we always define our effective actions on some sort of uh, world volume coordinates phi M with an embedding map uh, X mu. This ensures that energy and momentum are conserved. So oftentimes the equilibrium density matrix rho is going to describe some sort of a thermal state. So if it describes a thermal state, then your uh, generating functional enjoys the so-called KMS symmetries. I won't get into what those are, but if you want uh, W, your generating functional, to have KMS symmetries, then you need to impose uh, these, uh, these so-called dynamical KMS symmetries on your fields. And so what this does is for any anti-unitary time reversing symmetry theta, this could just be time inversion if that happens to be a, um, a symmetry of your UV theory. But at a minimum, you're going to have uh, something like CPT symmetry, which inverts time, space, and charge uh, and is anti-unitary. You want some residue of this time reversing symmetry to exist in the IR, but most IR systems, I mean, finite temperature IR systems are not time reversible uh, since entropy increases. So the way that these symmetries show up is in this unusual form of four, um, where the A field is related to a time derivative of the R field, which is quite unusual. It means that when we count powers in the effective field theory, we have to count phi A and the time derivative of phi R at the, as corresponding to the same order in the derivative expansion. Uh, so finally, um, can I, <clears throat> sorry, can yes. I ask a question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I guess beta zero is the inverse of the temperature. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Beta beta sub zero is the inverse temperature. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> is this, <clears throat> does this hold for all temperature or is this sort of a high temperature expansion? This is the classical limit. So you could think of this as a high temperature expansion. Yeah. There is a non-local version of this if you want to go into the quantum regime. Um, <clears throat> but okay. I don't care about that for present purposes. Okay. But Good. it is known. Can I, in, in the previous transparency, can I also ask a question? Uh, yeah. Um, can you flash it up again? Oh. So there are these two functionals. There's this functional W. Yes. Which depends on the gauge field and has this gauge symmetry. And there's the functional E effective, which depends on this sort of Stückelberg field. Right. Right. Um, I. So which one has a local expansion? Can I assume that the 
I effective is local in the field. Yes. So a derivative expansion in B1 and B2. And it's yes, that, that is an assumption that we're going to make because essentially the idea is that in the IR only conserved quantities matter. Um, this mm -hmm. sometimes this doesn't hold because you have other things going on, but oftentimes it's only conserved quantities that matter uh, if you're say far away from a phase transition. And so then these fields capture the IR behavior of these conserved quantities. And so all other fields are uh, either short-lived or gapped or so forth. And so, uh, so you, we expect this should be expendable as, uh, as a local action. But W, on the other hand, is, is also local? It should be non-local, presumably. That should be non-local, right? Yeah, just yeah. like if you have a, a standard um, generating functional for, let's say, like a massless free scalar, the corresponding generating functional for that will be non-local because mm -hmm. it'll involve uh, inverse powers of like box, the box operator. Right, right. But is it still true that because of the gauge invariance of W, could you still write it uh, as a functional of the field strength? Uh, so, potentially, um, I guess if you, if you would assume that it would be, be non-local, so it's. Yeah, that's a question. If it would be local, then I would say it has to have an expansion in terms of field strength, but. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, it's definitely not an expansion in terms of field strength, but you there may be some way to to put it into some non-local form with field strength. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the last comment I want to make on the rules for these non-equilibrium EFTs is uh, the so-called schringer keldish boundary conditions. So here we took a trace over uh, over this object, over the evolved density matrix. And what that does at the level of the path integral is it forces phi one and phi two fields to match up in the distant future, which then means that the, the A fields, the advanced fields in the distant future all vanish. So, because all global symmetries are independent of coordinates, this means that there's only one copy of any global symmetry, even as there's a double copy of this gauge symmetry when you include sources. Uh, and so this, the fact that there's only one copy of global symmetries is quite important. Um, if you're interested in looking for further reading, this is the archive number for a very nice review paper done by uh, Hong Lu and Paulo Glorioso on the subject. So when you construct uh, an action for something at finite temperature- Sorry, sorry can, you say, can you say again why they should run this boundary condition, can you? Yeah, so it comes from the fact that there's a trace in here, which then, uh, forces these, um, basically the way that the trace operates when you put it into a path integral is it forces the fields to match up in the, uh, in the distant future. Think about how if you take the trace of a uh, thermal density matrix and you want to express that as a uh, something in imaginary time, a path integral in imaginary time, you have to work in cyclic time. It's a similar kind of process mathematically speaking to that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so when you're trying to describe something like a fluid, uh, you need to impose certain boundary conditions. So, or sorry, not boundary conditions, gauge symmetries. So if you define your, uh, your, your space, um, to have full diffeomorphism symmetry. What this does is it, uh, it basically removes these X fields as dynamical degrees of freedom because you can just gauge fix the retarded X to be equal to phi 
and then you're basically constructing on the physical space time and that means your classical field is removed and the advanced field just ensures that uh, stress energy tensor is conserved. So if we begin by assuming just full diff symmetry on these five coordinates, then you have essentially a zero temperature um, system with uh, no spontaneously broken uh, uh, translations. So if you want to work with a finite temperature system, which is what a fluid is, it's basically just matter that is heated up uh, with no symmetries broken, except of course for Lorentz boosts. Then you have some sort of uh, inverse temperature four vector, beta m, uh, and it's a field that can exist uh, on, your, on your world volume. But we can then just gauge fix this uh, to make it equal to the equilibrium inverse temperature four vector. So you just stick it onto the, onto the uh, world volume and you're left with these residual uh, gauge symmetries. Essentially, these are diff symmetries that only depend on the spatial uh, world volume coordinates phi i or i equals one, two, three. So they're just time independent diffeomorphisms. So let's now construct an action for a solid with second sound. So the symmetry breaking pattern is the following. We have broken boosts, broken spatial rotations, broken translations, and then broken lattice momentum. Lattice momentum are U1 fields, or, sorry, U1 charges, QI. And because second sound exists, we're going to assume that QI are conserved. So they're going, so the corresponding goldstones will have to be Stuckelberg fields. So the unbroken symmetries we take to be temporal translations. There's nothing that, uh, that spontaneously breaks translation through time. And then you have a diagonal subgroup of momentum and lattice momentum that is preserved. Essentially, the idea of lattice momentum is that on large scale, is that on, on short scales, you have a lattice, which clearly spontaneously breaks symmetries. But if you zoom out and sort of blur your vision, then solids appear isotropic on large scales. And so you need this, these extra internal symmetries to ensure that, uh, that your solid has some sort of homogeneity on large distance scales. And we're dealing with uh, some sort of a lattice structure. So there are no internal rotations. So there's no unbroken form of rotations here. So if you want to construct an effective action for this, you have goldstones uh, that all represent by psi si. S is either one or two or R or A, uh, which tells you about where you are in the schwinger keldish contour. And these correspond to QI. And they have to appear uh, if you introduce gauge fields A, AI, as some sort of Stuckelberg fields. All of the other goldstones, like the goldstones associated with boosts, with rotations, um, are not going to show up. And the reason is that for any of you who are familiar with the COSEC construction, inverse Higgs mechanism is responsible for removing these goldstone fields. Basically, when you have spontaneously broken Poincaré symmetry, the number of goldstone fields does not need to equal the number of broken generators. So in addition, oh yeah. So then how, how many goldstones do you have? As many as, I mean, so you have one per each translation and lattice direction that momentum that is. Yeah, so if this is an ordinary solid, you have three, um, you have three goldstones for I equals one, two, three. Okay. But you're bro breaking both spatial translations and lattice momentum. Uh, yes, but this diagonal subgroup preserved. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So then uh, in addition to these goldstones, you want energy momentum to be conserved. So you have these X mu Stuckelberg fields. So that means the effective action 
takes the form uh, where it can depend on these pullback metrics, which were defined according to this equation. And then you have these, uh, basically they're unitary gauge uh, U1 fields B. And if you want to compute conserved currents, you just differentiate uh, with respect to the advanced field um, in, in either case, and then set all fields equal to zero just for simplicity so that we don't have to deal with a curved space time. Uh, and then the equations of motion are just the conservation of T mu nu and conservation of J i mu. So the fact that you differentiate with respect to the advanced fields uh, is, is very important. Um, and I won't get into it, but essentially if you want a, these are the retarded currents. If you wanted advanced currents, you would differentiate with respect to R fields. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the R fields are essentially the classical fields. And then the A fields, they ultimately vanish on shell, but there are various path integral tricks that you can use to get noise to show up. Uh, so if you want a classical field configuration, you need to differentiate with respect to the A fields. So at this point, we have both conserved energy momentum, which you always want. And then we have conserved lattice momentum, which indicates that second sound exists. So if you, uh, if you don't have second sound, then you want to kill the conservation of lattice momentum. But you still want QIs to be exact symmetries of your action. And the reason is, as I mentioned before, uh, you need to have some sense of, uh, of homogeneity on large distance scales. And so for an ordinary action, we would be out of luck because no there's theorem would force uh, all, all exact symmetries of the action, all global symmetries of the action to then also be, um, uh, to have corresponding conserved quantities. But uh, in this case, uh, there is, um, there's kind of a, a loophole with non-equilibrium effective field theories and I won't get into how the loophole actually works, but I'll show you that it, it does in fact work. So under the action of these QI, the Goldstones shift by a constant. But remember that there's only one copy of the global symmetries. So for each S, there's only one uh, constant CI that, that shifts which means that if you take the anti-symmetric combination of psi 1i and psi 2i, meaning psi ai, uh, you get something that does not transform under this u1 symmetry. So ai are actually completely invariant under all global symmetries. So if we want to, to kill qi as a conserved quantity, that is basically saying that we want the size to not be Stuckelberg fields. So you want them to show up in some form other than this. Oh, I'm sorry. I realized I typed a lambda here. This is lambda is supposed to be a psi. Um, but you want it to show up in some form other than a Stuckelberg field. And a way to do that is just to include AI without any derivatives. So then the effective action uh, can depend on G1, G2, B1, B2, and psi A. So if you define gamma i to just be the variation of i of t with respect to psi a, then the equations of motion become conservation of t mu nu, and then this non-conservation of j i mu. So now we have actually killed the nother current. Uh, and so this means that lattice momentum is not conserved. And so second sound uh, is no longer existent in this system. So uh, let's see 
explicitly how this can work and, uh, and also get this into kind of a, a simplified form. So the leading order action, we can express, um, remember how I said earlier that the A fields count as derivatives in, uh, of the retarded fields, which means that we can't have too many A fields. Um, but uh, whenever you have the leading order action, you have the X A mu field coupled to T mu nu, you have the Psi A field coupled to J I mu, you have the Psi A field coupled to this gamma I, which is the non-conservation of this current. And then you have this other field that has two A fields and this describes noise, essentially. Um, notice that all of the fields in this effective action have at least one copy of an A field. That's a very important feature of non-equilibrium EFTs. Uh, that was actually a rule that I should have mentioned earlier, which is that all, all terms have to have at least one advanced term. What this means is that when you differentiate with respect to the retarded fields, uh, the equations of motion for the advanced fields are always advanced fields equals zero. So on shell, your advanced field always vanishes. Um, but as I mentioned before, you can do some path integral tricks to extract information from them. So they're not dead weight. They actually contain a lot of valuable information about fluctuations, but those aren't relevant for the time being. So the exact form of T mu nu and J I mu don't really matter for the present considerations, but dynamical KMS symmetries impose the following relation between gamma and M. Here, T naught is the equilibrium temperature. So uh, the reason, um, essentially, M encodes uh, stuff about fluctuations. Gamma encodes information about dissipation. This can be viewed as the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Uh, the dynamical KMS symmetries at basically at leading order tell you uh, the um, fluctuation dissipation theorem, but at higher order, they give even more constraints than just that. Um, so if you look at the strong Unclap scattering limit, that's the limit in which the non-conservation of, uh, of J is very large. Then I uh, notice that this term in the equation of motion has a derivative. This term has no derivatives, meaning that uh, in the low energy limit, uh, the term with derivatives becomes negligible. That's higher order in the derivative expansion. So essentially, uh, you can neglect this term in the action if you have a strong Unclap scattering limit. And your equations of motion of non-conservation of J just become uh, gamma I is equal to zero which then is satisfied by setting the time derivative of psi r equal to zero. So notice that if the time derivative of psi r vanishes, then psi r is time independent. It only depends on the spatial coordinates phi vector. And now we can use this, uh, this gauge symmetry. Notice if you have uh, M equals one, two, or three, this is just a full spatial, spatial diffeomorphism symmetry. So you can, at this point, use this full spatial diffeomorphism symmetry to just gauge fix phi i equals psi i. And now we can, uh, and then also the psi a vanishes on shell. So the, uh, you can now define solid world volume coordinates where sigma naught is equal to phi naught and sigma i equals psi i r. And then there's a residual gauge symmetry where uh, the sigma naught still shifts by a spatially varying arbitrary function. And the uh, spatial components just shift by constant amounts. Or uh, yeah, just shift by constant amounts, but continuous constants. So I'm now going to tell you a bit about how the COSET construction works from this perspective. 
Um, I won't go terribly into the COSA construction, but basically the way uh, COSETs work is they're a tool for constructing symmetry and variant terms for an action. And there's this thing called an inverse Higgs constraint, which if you have uh, more gold stones than you actually need for your IR theory, there you can essentially set symmetry invariant objects to zero uh, and use that as it can either be a gauge fixing constraint if you have redundant, if your gold stones are somehow redundant degrees of freedom, or it can be an integrating out process, sort of like what we just did here. You integrate out these psi fields. And so this uh, process of integrating out psi can be viewed as an inverse Higgs constraint where you just set the, this is a symmetry invariant equation. This is also a symmetry invariant equation. So these are legitimate inverse Higgs constraints. Notice also that um, together these are invariant under the dynamical KMS symmetries, because if you recall, uh, psi r just shifts to theta times psi r, and psi a uh, gets a time derivative of the r term. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background. Can you hear what I'm saying? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear it. Uh, okay, but the noise is coming from your side, right? Because we are. Already... Uh, it is. Let me see if I can no. find a, a quieter place. No, I think okay. I think it's okay. At least for me, it was okay. Uh, it's okay. Okay, then I'll I'll just I'll stay. Um, so essentially, uh, you have um, the uh, yeah these dynamical KMS symmetries involve a time derivative for uh, the R fields, which means that if you have both the time derivative of psi R and psi a set to zero, then these are completely compatible with your dynamical KMS symmetries. So this means that the final action for fluids without second sound looks a lot like the um, action for, uh, for fluids. So solids without second sound looks like the action for, for fluids, um, except for the fact that we define it on the solid world volume with these diffeomorphism with these gauge symmetries, as opposed to the enlarged gauge symmetries of fluids. Um, and so this is really the only difference is, uh, is, the, is the diffeomorphism symmetry. So uh, lastly, I want to talk about dispersion relations, just to convince you that second sound has actually gone. If you uh, deal with these effective actions, then you will find the uh, dispersion relations as follows. So if you have lattice momentum conserved, um, or if you don't have lattice momentum conserved, you always have some sort of longitudinal uh, lattice sound wave and some sort of transverse lattice sound wave. Uh, now, if you have an anisotropic lattice, you can actually have multiple sound waves, but I've glossed over that for now. Um, if you have second sound, you also have a fluid wave. This is a second longitudinal wave. That's why it's called second sound, because you have your first longitudinal lattice wave. And then you have also a pressure wave that travels through the fluid. And this occurs because you have your, these basically occur from your gold stones. And these arise because you have your Stuckelberg fields x mu that correspond to energy conservation. And then these can fluctuate independently. If you have no second sound, then you have a your hydrodynamic mode that was propagating now becomes diffusive. Uh, and so this basically tells you that uh, energy diffuses through your system. So there's there's no second sound. It, um, uh, it's basically the energy is locked into the lattice, except it can diffuse a little bit. Then finally, if umclap scattering is weak, then lattice momentum is approximately conserved. And you can get the hydrodynamic mode uh, has this dispersion relation, where notice that in the, uh, in the low frequency limit, this omega becomes small, and you get 
uh, omega is proportional to k squared, which reproduces uh, this, dis this dispersion relation with diffusion, as long as you make the appropriate identification with tau and c uh, and d. Conversely, if you work in the high frequency region, then this uh, term becomes negligible compared to this term, and you recover a propagating sound mode. So if you have, uh, if you have mostly gotten rid of your in-class scattering, but not entirely, which is usually what happens, you, uh, I think you generally can't completely get rid of in-class scattering. Uh, then you will get this kind of dispersion relation that sort of interpolates between uh, propagating in the high frequency regime and diffusion in the low frequency regime. Sorry, can, can I ask another question? Sure. Yeah, uh, let's see. <clears throat> in this, uh, what, what assumption go into this, right? So equation 19. Now, yes. This equation, I know that one can derive by uh, the assumption of having like one U1 current and another which is slightly broken and they interact with each other and you get this model and <clears> you get this uh, equation 19, right? Which then when the relaxation time for tau goes to zero here, yeah, you get the second sound, right? Um, that's right. Yeah. Actually, shouldn't I think it should the tau? I think should be in front of the. Um, uh, I don't know. That's something with it. Oh, oh, sorry. Right. Yeah, there should be. A, this should be a one over tau. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, how how universal is this? Because this is not what's happening uh, in many systems where a second sound appears. There's actually something else happening. The most. Uh, yeah. Well, what what do you see happening? Uh, well, I, I know, for example, when, when you do holography and you see where second sound comes from in, in a spontaneous breaking of uh, CAU1 symmetry in holography, mm -hmm. uh, that's not what's happening. What's happening is that there is actually, uh, so this would indicate that there's an interplay of two modes, right? One mode in one phase, the mode is sort of diffusive and another mode is gapped, right? And well, then, this uh, I would say that this is just a single mode for a weakly non-conserved U1 current. Basically, it's like if you take this uh, this dispersion relation and just go to higher order in your derivative expansion. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, there, there are different ways of deriving this this particular model. Yeah. Um, so, well, my way of doing it is basically. Is basically that taking this and going to higher order. Yeah. Derivative expansion. Yeah. Okay. But um, sort of my point is that if you look to um, the number of modes that come together at omega equals zero and k equals zero, let's say, right? Well, no. And, and in the limit where this tau goes to infinity, which is sort of the critical point where you have the, 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 the there is a transition, right? Between diffusive and uh, propagating behavior for this mode, right? Right. And in this model, at, at this critical point where you, ha you have sort of two modes, which are uh, hydrodynamic, if you want. But um, what I wanted to say, I'm not sure if this is getting very clear. Uh, if, if you look how these modes combine to, to, to make up second sound in explicit examples, like in holography, you find, for example, that there's a different, different way of modes, how modes combine. So what dispersion relation so, do you see though? Yeah, what, what I would like to know is uh, I, um, what goes uh, what sort of assumptions went into this, uh, which gives you this model 19? So uh, the, uh, if you work from an effective action like this, and yeah. you go to quadratic order um, in your fields, then uh, you get uh, 19. I see, I see. 
I see. Mm -hmm. And you can you can identify what these parameters are in, in this uh, effective uh, field theory, the, the different speed of sounds and diffusion constant and so on. Uh, yes, I don't recall what they are off the top of my head, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you just explicitly expand out your effective action in terms yeah. of, yeah, quadratic order and you get these out. Okay, okay. thank you. I, you probably should go on, we can discuss first. Okay, I mean, I, I'm essentially uh, at the end, so it's it's no problem. Uh, so the conclusion is that um, symmetries of the of the effective action do not lead to conserved node occurrence uh, for non-equilibrium effective field theories. Uh, to get conserved node occurrence, you additionally need to make your Goldstone Stuckelberg fields. The Internal solid symmetries, QI, are always exact, at least if you look at, if you zoom out, um, if you were to make a model that can account for the actual lattice structure, then presumably they're not exact, but on large scales they are. However, they don't always enjoy no other currents. Second sound is, uh, arises whenever lattice momentum is conserved and Second sound dies whenever lattice momentum uh, is not conserved. So then if lattice momentum is not conserved, you can remove uh, the Goldstones associated with QI by inverse Higgs constraints. Uh, and so if you are interested in reading further on this, I have a paper on the COSEC construction and a paper on second sound, which is what most of this work has been based on. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk, Michael. I think we are running a bit out of time since there's another seminar at four. All right. All right. I mean, <laughs> don't worry. I mean, we are free to discuss here, and whoever yeah. wants to go to the other seminar can go. That's why we are using a different account. So. Okay, perfect. Um, do you have any questions? I, I have one. I could start. Um, you, you showed us the speed of the, the longitudinal and transfer speed. Are they undetermined coefficients or do you have formulas for them? Oh, so, well, in a certain sense, they're undetermined in that every coefficient in an EFT is undetermined. Uh, but if you write down an effective action that was of the form with the team you knew, J, I, mu, et cetera, then you can relate those speeds of sound to objects that you can identify as like the pressure and that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, so, so you could do that. Uh, yeah, and so I don't, remember what those are at the top of my head, but they're the standard things that you expect. I, remember I, I think for the for the fluid, the transverse speed of sound is zero, right? If I'm not oh, mistaken. sure. For, for a fluid, the transverse speed of sound is zero unless you go to higher order. In fact, I'm working on a project with Matteo right now in which we look at transverse speed of sound. Um, but at low energies, yes, it is zero. OK. Are there more questions? Yeah, I, I can probably. Right. I was still recording. Okay. Um, I can stop the recording. So. Makes the discussion easier. One can ask nonsense. Yeah, maybe stop the recording. <laughs>